to me. I'm not going <laughs> to tell them my location. Yeah. Is there such a thing as a Zoom arrest? <laughs> well, why don't we get started? JC, you want to let in everybody from the waiting room? I've been letting them in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we get started? For those of you who are new to this, welcome. Uh, this is a pro project of the Campaign for Trauma Informed Policy and Practice, the CTIP. And it's got two purposes. One is to provide you with information on what's going on in Congress uh, and the hopes that you will use that information to encourage your congressmen, senators to uh, support trauma-informed legislation. Uh, and then secondly, it's to provide presentations on innovative trauma-informed work going on around the country. Today, we have a very powerful presentation on trauma-informed policing. Uh, we have uh, three police captains, I think, with us, and a, um, somebody from the Attorney General's office who should be focusing on his driving, um, and several others who will be talking about trauma-informed policing. So welcome. Uh, I usually start the call with something that's a little ray of sunshine to cheer us up during these bad times. Today, I'm actually going to give you a downer. Um, I'm not sure how many of you heard, but uh, Jamie Redford uh, passed away yesterday. Uh, Jamie Redford is the, was the director of Paper Tiger and the paper uh, director of Resilience. Uh, and through those uh, videos, those films, he reached millions of people to educate them about trauma. Uh, we were told by his office that they have a uh, distribution list of 30 million people from all over the world. So uh, he devoted his life to making trauma information available to everybody. And um, we're really going to miss him. Uh, but he left quite a legacy. And, and we're so appreciative of what he did. Um, uh, a couple of an announcements. One is uh, we encourage everybody on the phone to reach out to the organizations you're working with to encourage everybody to vote. Uh, this is going to be a critical election, and all of you have contact with various uh, constituency groups, uh, organizations. Please do everything you can to get everybody out to vote. Uh, many of you represent or work with organizations that are uh, people with folks who historically haven't voted that much. And it'd be really important to help them get out there, uh, to get them out there to vote. Um, secondly, uh, CTIP is forming a committee of state legislators to work together to promote statewide legislation. And um, if you have a state legislator in, that you know of that is interested in trauma, please let me know and we'll uh, recruit him hopefully to join this, uh, this new committee. The states are doing much more innovative work than Congress uh, in terms of implementing trauma-informed legislation. And we want to uh, have this committee available to help any legislator anywhere in the country who's looking for advice or uh, examples of what's been done in other states to make it easy for them to access that information through this committee. So please let me know, uh, uh, the legislator. Um, well, we have, uh, those not familiar with CTIP, okay. Um, third, um, the uh, two, Two found funding sources have awarded grants to promote statewide trauma-informed programs. Uh, the Center for Disease Control awarded a grant to four states, uh, Georgia, no, um, Michigan, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and uh, Michigan. And the Robert Wood Foundation gave money to the National Governors Association which is 
of assisting four states with technical assistance to become trauma-informed states. Uh, those are uh, Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Wyoming. And both organizations have promised that the work product that comes out of their assistance to these states will be made available to everybody else. So hopefully soon, by early next year, we're gonna have a, a body of information available on how to be a, uh, how to create a statewide trauma-informed program. And it's just exciting that uh, those organizations have concluded that helping states become trauma-informed and implement trauma-informed structures is a priority for them. So those are my announcements. And I'd like to now turn it over to Jeff Hill to talk about an important piece of legislation that recently got introduced in Congress uh, that we're going to be asking you to support. Jeff? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and, and nice to see everybody. Um, my name is Jeff Hild. I, I work at George Washington University School of Public Health. Um, and uh, we help to run a, a nationwide network and collaborative called Building uh, Community Resilience. Um, and you all have probably heard me um, talking on these uh, calls before. Um, so just wanted to spend a few minutes um, talking about some legislation that was introduced uh, earlier this month uh, called the Strong Support for Children Act. Uh, it's HR 8544 and actually just drops a um, kind of the summary of it uh, into the chat box uh, for you to take a look at. Um, but as some of you, as some of you remember uh, last uh, summer, summer of 2019 and the uh, before times, um, the late uh, chairman uh, Elijah Cummings held uh, the first ever um, hearing in Congress on childhood trauma. Um, it was in the Oversight and Government Reform Committee um, on the House, uh, and anyone who was there or watched it, um, it was really struck by uh, sort of the power of that uh, hearing um, and the focus that some of the members of that committee had um, on uh, this issue that, that we care about. Um, so out of that, um, uh, Cummings, uh, and then later uh, Congresswoman uh, Maloney from New York, um, who uh, took over the committee uh, after uh, Congressman Cummings passed away, um, began working on a couple pieces of, of legislation. Um, and one of them is the, the Strong Support for Children Act, which um, uh, again was introduced a couple weeks ago uh, by, by Maloney and uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley from uh, Boston. Um, so the, the bill kind of has two components. So the first one and the one that, that we were most um, uh, interested in um, is really to center um, local public health departments uh, in addressing uh, ACEs really at the, the community and neighborhood level. So, so what it would do is provide funds um, for health departments to identify specific neighborhoods um, with high levels um, of adversity. So that could be things like a uh, high number of referrals to child welfare, High rates, high rates of uh, parental incarceration, um, high levels of community violence, that type of thing. Uh, and then use um, basically uh, community engagement techniques um, to work with the community to identify uh, needed uh, supports um, and policy level and programmatic level changes to address the kind of root causes uh, or drivers of those uh, adversities. Uh, and then it would actually fund um, uh, paying for those types of services and then evaluate to see um, the extent to which they lowered um, uh, rates of uh, ACEs as well as improved outcomes for, for children. Um, so that's one uh, part of the bill. Uh, and then the second part um, would again fund uh, public health departments um, to provide care coordination uh, services for parents with uh, young children, so, so uh, kids zero to five. Basically, and this would pay for things like community health workers, um, systems navigators, care coordinators, um, to really link those families with trauma-informed um, supports uh, and, and services and allow them to navigate um, kind of across multiple uh, systems. So uh, in a nutshell, that's the bill. Um, you can take a deeper dive with the, the document I, I posted uh, in the chat box um, or reach out to me with, with any questions. Um, but uh, we're trying to assist uh, Congresswoman Presley in building support for the bill. Um, her office has put together a day of action. Um, it's actually tomorrow. Um, so they're asking um, folks who support the bill 
um, to take to social media uh, around four o'clock to express um, uh, support uh, for the legislation using the, the hashtag strong support for children. Um, they've actually put together a uh, toolkit with sample tweets and uh, Facebook posts and that sort of thing. Um, and Dan, I wonder if um, it makes sense uh, for you just to send that um, around to the list uh, via email so folks have it. Um, yeah. I don't think I have it in a form where I could um, post it uh, up on the chat. Um, but that's the Strong Support for Children uh, Act. Um, you know, I think this is a really novel and innovative um, uh, approach that would really be community driven um, and uh, really allow communities to uh, really empower communities um, to come up with uh, local uh, solutions that are going to work um, for them and that are really grounded uh, in community uh, wisdom and strengths. Um, so I'll stop there, Dan. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, yeah, Congresswoman Presley really is the heir apparent to the late Congressman Cummings, and it's exciting that she's introduced this legislation. I think she's going to be a great advocate in, now and in the coming years. Um, which leads to the uh, last announcement. Um, CTIP, as many of you know, is running the national campaign to recruit volunteers in every congressional district to encourage their Congress people to support trauma-informed legislation, and this will be one of the things we'll be supporting. Jesse, do you want to just take a couple of seconds to talk about the campaign? Sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so the National Trauma Campaign is looking to recruit advocates in all 435 legislative districts across the country to develop relationships with their congressional representatives um, in order to help us move toward what will become comprehensive action um, and a policy vision that creates a trauma-informed United States and a resilience-focused United States. Uh, we are looking for diversity. We are looking for as many people as possible to uh, illustrate the groundswell of support that will hopefully ultimately uh, leverage support to motivate Congress to pass and create action similar to what Jeff just shared. Um, but more as, as we move forward to create the future that we all uh, you know, know we deserve and, and is possible. So I will put uh, links to sign up if you haven't already in the chat momentarily. And there is also a toolkit and a newsletter that we just sent out to help uh, you leverage your networks to help us grow the campaign. Um, so that's all, thanks Dan. Uh, one other issue I want to raise is on the possibility that there's going to be a new administration. We are developing a trauma-informed first 100 days document, things that an administration can do to promote trauma-informed programs within the federal government without needing legislation, which takes much longer, but administration action can happen very quickly. And we're soliciting uh, your assistance in coming to us with ideas that you know of that you think the federal government could implement to promote trauma-informed in its different programs that doesn't require new legislation. So um, we look forward to all of your wisdom on that. And we have reason to believe that uh, we, we're not taking size, but if uh, Vice President Biden does get elected, uh, we have people, including some people on the phone, uh, who have great relationships with, with him and his team, and we should be able to have a way to get uh, input our ideas into the, the new administration. So come up with your, with your creative ideas. Uh, we think it's uh, very possible we can get some really good stuff going very quickly in the new administration. Um, Send me the, I, ju I put my email address on the uh, chat room. Uh, please send your ideas to me. I'll collect them and then disseminate it to all of you. We'll probably talk about it at our November uh, CTIP pan. But in the meantime, just send them to me and I'll collate them. With that, uh, I'd like to move on to the, <clears throat> the main act of our presentation today, which is uh, actually two sets of presentations on 
uh, trauma-informed policing and how you can implement trauma-informed policing in your communities. Uh, Becky, are you on? Becky? Yeah, I'm here, Dan. Okay. Um, Becky Haas uh, will be moderating the, the first panel and introducing her participants. So Becky, take it away. Okay, thank you, Dan. And it's great to always join these calls and good to see so many, many familiar faces. Um, okay, so I'm Becky Haas and there are five others that are joining me um, that, um, wait, four others that are joining me and collectively we're gonna take about 40 minutes and tell you what we're doing um, in trauma-informed policing and justice fields. Um, so I'm going to just give a word of who else will be on here, and then we're just going to roll one from the other. Um, following me is going to be um, Chief David Roddy from the Chattanooga, Tennessee uh, Police Department. He's the chief there. And then uh, following Chief Roddy will be Marsha Morgan, who's the Executive Director of Resilience Builders in Missouri. Um, she's done work with the Kansas City Police Department Department, as well as others. And then following Marsha will be Chief Chris Lusner from Middle Township, New Jersey. And uh, he's just uh, uh, hard to sit still. Uh, we were all on a call yesterday uh, together with ACES Connection. Um, and I'm sure you're going to learn a lot from all of these. And then uh, bringing up the uh, uh, end of the bat today will be Rob Reed, uh, who is in the Attorney General's office in Pennsylvania. He's the um, executive deputy attorney general um, and do, does some work with training and specialty programs. Um, so we're just going to move one to the next, take about seven or eight minutes each um, and hope today we're going to give you some ideas how to work with law enforcement. Uh, so my story began working for the Johnson City, Tennessee Police Department um, in 2014. Um, I, I had already been there a few years um, I was no stranger to working with officers for six years. I worked at East Tennessee State University under Governor's Highway Safety Office funding, and I trained officers in 33 counties of Tennessee in car seat safety, and I see some um, uniformed officers and captains on the call today, so maybe your departments have um, run the gamut with the car seat programs through the years. <clears throat> and then I was hired at the John City Police Department uh, to direct an 800,000 OCJP um, crime reduction grant, and it was to reduce drug-related and violent crime in two areas of Johnson City that historically have the highest amount of crime. And one of the interventions I had to do was oversee uh, development of a program to reduce recidivism, and I worked with the judges, the DA, probation and parole, uh, and we created a program that ended up becoming a state model in the state of Tennessee, and at the end of the grant, Tennessee Department of Corrections acquired that program and have used it as a model across the state of Tennessee called the Day Reporting Center. But it was in that context that I heard about trauma-informed care in 2014, and I wondered why that I was being asked to reduce drug-related and violent crime and reduce recidivism among felony offenders with addictions, nobody was talking about. Um, the significant risk factor of trauma, childhood trauma without healthy support, um, that it's a significant risk factor to addiction. I mean, heavy hitters, the CDC, SAMHSA, um, the Pew Charitable Trust did a study in 2014 that uh, compared Tennessee to New Jersey and Tennessee ranks fifth highest state to use incarceration to work with drug crimes while New Jersey is about 45th, yet our drug rates continue to grow. And so that report concluded that incarceration is not reducing um, drug crimes and drug use. And I know from being in many city commission meetings, working with state and local legislators that um, that the cost to build new jails, one of our small counties here in Virginia, the jail cost 650,000 to run in 2010. And in 2018, it cost $2.9 million. And, and so what I saw in ACEs and trauma-informed care gave us an upstream approach um, to begin to deal with some of the things that are the most costly um, challenges faced by every community. Um, so I uh, partnered with a psychology professor at East Tennessee State University, 
after we saw that SAMHSA wrote a concept paper in 2014, and I've presented on CTIP calls before uh, about that work, and it said to raise awareness about ACEs by public education to every kind of sector. And so it wasn't in our job description. We had no funding. And in three years, we'd trained about 4,000 people. And, um, and people came from SAMHSA in 2018, two first ladies, uh, Miss Haslam from Tennessee and Tracy Quillen Carney. Uh, Dan was at that event. And we told our story. And they said that we'd created a model for cities to follow. But in those 4,000 that were trained, I had yet to train police. Um, because I really wasn't certain what was the lens that law enforcement would use. Um, you know, I have to say I've been called hug a thug um, because, um, you know, when you begin to talk about trauma, it's not an excuse for drugs or crime, but now it offered us an explanation. Um, so I knew there had to be training developed for officers. So I created um, with much research and lo and behold, I found the peers of police were saying a lot of things about trauma-informed care. The International Chiefs Association, actually in 2019, one of their resolutions was that officers around the globe understand about ACEs. And then I began to see the National Child Traumatic Stress Network um, and different ones, Yale University and ICAP put together a toolkit on reducing childhood trauma on scene. And so I was able to compile a three hour training in 2017 that received um, post certification in Tennessee and it's received post ever since then. It's, it's, we're in our third year of having post. Um, and so I began to do training um, for police officers in Tennessee. Um, and then I was reached out to from the Oklahoma City Police Department um, who was wanting to launch Handle with Care, uh, which is a education police partnership program where officers are on scene with children that might be a domestic violence call, arresting a parent, uh, that type thing. And if it's traumatic, the officer um, issues a simple email or however the command is set up. Um, to the school principal where the child attends, just saying their name, Joey Brown, handle with care. And so uh, I went to Oklahoma City in 2019 in three trips and helped put together, train their senior administration, their chiefs, uh, their academy. And then I did a train the trainer with Oklahoma City training division, as well as seven other departments, including CLEAT. So it's CLEAT certified in the state of Oklahoma. And if you visit my website at beckyhaas.com, you'll see kind endorsements that came from the chief Wade Gorley and other administrative staff um, in Oklahoma. Um, so my three hour training, um, I have since then trained officers in North Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee and Oklahoma. Earlier today, I was on the phone with Maggie Duncan, who is the um, uh, uh, Chief Rowdy, I'm sure knows Maggie. She's a president of the Tennessee Association of Chiefs of Police and our governor, Governor Bill Lee, passed legislation handled with care law. And so due to COVID, instead of trying to do a lot of in-person police training, uh, Maggie and I partnered up and I'm working with uh, UT uh, Knoxville uh, law, law uh, uh, enforcement uh, innovation program there. And we're gonna be creating a professional video of me doing the police training that TCAP is, or, or the Tennessee Association is gonna log on and have on their uh, Handle With Care website. So we'll be training police officers across the state in understanding trauma. Uh, so the training that I developed talks about three ways that officers um, can be um, reduced trauma on scene, uh, what can, can, why they need to know about trauma. One is, is guidelines of how to reduce trauma on scene particularly for um, children. And so I have best practices in there from National Child Traumatic Stress Network, including an officer training video that comes from National Child Traumatic Stress Network with five core messages officers need, officers need to know when they're on a DV call. And, and really, as a mother and a grandmother, the reason I decided police had to be trained was one day working for police, I heard a 911 call of a four-year-old watching their mother being beat with a ball bat. And I'm sorry to be really super graphic there, but I thought I knew statistically because I wrote the grant for our police department to get a family justice center uh, because of the amount of domestic violence in our small community in 2015, we averaged nine calls a day, every day 
every shift, every 12 hours, nine calls of domestic. And so I knew it took seven acts of violence before someone reached out for advocates, uh, but yet they were still interacting with police. And most of you that are police on the call today know that your officers can ride around your town and you have a snapshot of things going on in neighborhoods that many don't see and, and that's not a good thing, but, but you know because of the calls you get. Um, so I knew that police could be an intervention. So the training includes how to reduce trauma on scene. And then I give um, examples of reducing community trauma. Um, the Department of Justice uh, has a program that Erie, Pennsylvania launched in 2017 after an officer um, uh, shooting uh, that resulted in the death of a gentleman um, and some riots ensued. Um, and so I actually was involved in a program at Johnson City. Uh, uh, the president of our NAACP came to see our chief after the Ferguson shooting and asked how could we strengthen community relations. So I was involved in a program called Community Roundtable where we started um, Coffee with a Cop and um, a mini party in the park. We had every demographic, uh, Jewish community, the Muslim community, Protestant community, the FBI, LGBTQ, um, and coming together every month together. And that's the type of program uh, that we talk about in, in that training. And then lastly is officer wellness. Um, the two most important, I think, uh, instruments of police reform that have been, been written in the last 10 years is one was 21st century policing under the Obama administration and the second, a new era of public safety. And of the pillars that both of these recommend for officer reform, both of them say that community policing needs to be a stronghold in a department as well as addressing officer wellness. And, and honestly, uh, professionals that are on this call today, I am shocked at the departments that I talk to and they have zero resources in place for help. I trained a police department and the young officers begged me to meet with the chief that they had no resources locally to address um, the day-to-day -day trauma. Um, so in 2018 and 2019, more officers took their own life in suicide than were killed in the line of duty. And I know from working for police, about 97% of the officer training is all around those second and third leading causes of death. Um, so I've done work also with TBI. Um, they invited me to come in 2018 to speak to the Senator Tommy Burke's Victims Academy. And they asked me to talk about why trauma-informed multidisciplinary teams are important um, because, and I did a case study with the victim advocates, about 75 that were there. And I asked them in a couple of scenarios, domestic violence with children, a rape of a college student on a campus, to name the agencies that would all be touch points in working those cases or working, navigating that. And in every single one of them, police are involved, but many times police are not brought to the table around this conversation. Um, so in 2019, I co-authored a toolkit on how to trauma inform your town. It was for the Tennessee Department of Children's Services. In December this year, it's gonna be um, part of uh, Johns Hopkins um, Progress in Community Health Research Education and Action Journal, um, which we're super excited about that. But one of the groups we find a lot of communities that I work with now as an independent trainer and a consultant is having this conversation with police. Um, and so um, in the toolkit, I give some tips on some things that helped. And yesterday, our other distinguished law enforcement folks on the call today shared a bunch of tips um, as well. So uh, the training, like I said, is certified in uh, two states. And uh, I, you know, I'm just delighted and excited at the opportunity uh, to see law enforcement using trauma-informed practices. In my training, I also, um, include some best practices of what departments some departments are doing across the nation that's trauma-informed policing. Some really good stuff starting to emerge. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chief Roddy. Thank you, Becky. Um, Becky set quite the tempo there, so I'm going to try and keep up with that. I, I may stop to breathe. I don't know that Becky did, which is impressive, but uh, I will do my best. Uh, my name is David Roddy. I'm the chief of police for the Chattanooga Police Department in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, it's about a population of around 180,000, and I have 500 sworn positions and 124 professional staff positions in my agency. And about six years ago, we decided to pay particular attention to how we were supporting victims in our city, 
how we as law enforcement responded to those that had been impacted and affected by trauma and violence. And we started in kind of an internal piece together that we called Community and Police Response to Victims of Violence or CPRVB. And what this called for was a team member or a team comprised of Chattanooga police officers and community leaders and members, some faith based, some just community based, that would actually go and meet with the victim to engage and figure out what happened. Why, what was the trajectory that caused them to be in the path of that violence? What can we do to support them to change their trajectory of all of that? And it was just something that we kind of put together to, to figure out how to do a better job. That actually then advanced to us being awarded a grant through the International Association Chiefs of Police, IECP, to be one of the three partner cities for the Enhancing Law Enforcement's Response to Victims or ELER program, which we are in our fourth year of. And that has progressed and grown through our department much stronger and better than I could have even imagined. Um, it moved from a single victim services coordinator to we now have a victim services director and five advocates, social workers that are employed directly by the police department. And we've spread out their case management responsibilities as this has grown. Um, everything from a, a bilingual advocate to help in our Latinx community to two of the crisis management advocates that actually deploy from the patrol car. They ride around with our officers during the shift to be on the scene when the violence occurs and they can immediately link up with that victim, determine impact, determine needs and move from there. So that's that's where we started our, our formalized understanding of what trauma informed policing looks like. Uh, we, we've joked all the time that our list of feeling words has grown tremendously over the last six years. Uh, they probably originally consisted of angry and hungry, um, but those have spread into a much better understanding of how we communicate what we say, but more importantly, what we hear. Um, and so this has gone a long way to help us understand how to open our ears a little bit. We've set up programs within our agency that we like to call education through raindrops. So I'm gonna list a lot of programs and connection points very, very quickly. Um, so if there's, I need to expand on any, please hit me in the chat. But one of the programs that we start with in the academy is called a community immersion program. And we believe it's important for our cadets to understand the perspectives and viewpoints of the communities that they're about to go out and police to try and protect and serve. And what this requires is, is our police academy of X number of cadets are broken into smaller groups. Each one of those smaller groups over a certain number of weeks in the academy are tasked with going out and interviewing and meeting and engaging with whatever that particular segment of Chattanooga's diverse population who they are, um, whether that's the African-American community, the Latinx community, LGBTQ+, um, development or um, mental health crisis, substance abuse, whatever we're seeing at that point in time when that academy starts, we need to get into an engagement conversation. with them. So the cadets go out for X number of weeks, they do interviews, they study, they listen to, to, to do some historical research on what that part of our city has looked like and grown from. And then at the end of the academy, the cadets come back and make a public presentation in a coffee house or an open theater to where the community can come in as well as the command and executive staff and listen to these presentations. What did the cadets learn? Um, coming from Tennessee, uh, we are surrounded by somewhat of a rural population in certain areas. And I've had cadets express to me that when they were asked to go meet with a member of say the Latinx community, uh, they've literally said, I, I've never spoken to anyone from that background before. Now, I couldn't imagine then that, that officer getting an assignment into a certain part of our city and expecting to engage with the knowledge, the intellectual and emotional intelligence to have a conversation to understand the perspective of that individual, much less when that individual is trying to express when they're in crisis. So the community immersion program starts the path of understanding someone else's viewpoint and especially someone else's viewpoint from a trauma perspective. Um, what does hardship look like? They also go through a poverty simulator, which members of our department already sworn engage with them in as well. So they go through a poverty simulator so they can learn what are the struggles, what are the, the complications um, and, and experiences of our homeless population. That continues the, the, I guess the educational slant of just learn more, learn more about someone else's perspective. And with that, our department then ventured into a better understanding of what ACEs was. Uh, I'll be honest with you, four years ago, didn't know what it was, never heard of it. I've got enough acronyms in my life as a police officer. I was like, you know what? I don't know that I need another one. Then I took the time, stopped and learned, and I realized that I was wrong. Um, I took the time to become a certified ACES trainer um, through the state. 
And every single police officer in our department receives ACES training in our annual in-service and attends attend specialized training throughout the year. So they have an understanding when I talk, others talk, they go out in the community and they, and they hear things, we have a commonality in language that we may not have had before. Um, that breaks down some of the barriers and miscommunications. That also helps us when I have officers that understand the importance of building up the children, the youth in our community, when we throw out as many youth engagement programs that we do in our department, they understand the need why. Um, a list of those are Handle With Care, as Becky explained a minute ago. We started that two years ago between us and Hamlin County Department of Education. We're also involved in a program called Bigs and Blue, which is through the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, which is specifically designed for police officers to engage with their little brother or little sister in school. Um, I have a little brother, his name's Antonio. He's been my little for about three years and I go see Antonio about every week or two. I'll walk in, he kicks my butt in Battleship. We have a pretty good time. And then I get to see Antonio the next week. And right now we're FaceTiming. But I have other members of my command, executive staff and police department that have littles in the school system. Um, and it's a twofold win. Um, it helps us engage with, with youth in our schools but they're also at the elementary school level, which puts in a police officer in an elementary school, which does not have a school resource officer here in Hampton County. So it does give you an increased security presence in the school and a connection between the police department and that individual school. So if there are any issues as a police department that we need to know about, we have a direct connection with that school administrators. So we move into the boys and girls clubs. I'm on the board of directors. We're starting a conversation now where I have officers coming out of patrol that are going to go into the clubs and they're going to have social justice conversations. How do you, what do you do when you get stopped by a police officer? Why does a police officer do this? Why do you not do that? Um, we get to hear what it's like to be policed by us as a juvenile in the city of Chattanooga. But then we also get to explain our perspectives. I, I joke all the time and ask people, you know why officers always stand with their arms across their chest? I was like, because we don't have hips. We wear a gun belt, um, but they never think about that. So when we start to ex explain some of our own postures, some of our own mannerisms, it breaks down the barriers. We can get into some real solid conversations with teenagers in our city in the boys and girls clubs. Um, we're in a program called YCAP, which is a boxing program through the YMCA, where police officers train in a boxing gym with area youth. But before they can do the physical training, the police officer has to sit down and tutor that young man or woman on their homework before they can do the physical training. So it helps the officers just engage in kind of a coach and mentoring position. Uh, we have a program called Coaches, Cops and Community, where our officers are volunteer football coaches in junior league. And the best part of this one is as the officers are engaging with the kids, either at practice or at the games and tournaments, I teach and explain ACEs to the football coaches. And I've had numerous coaches explained to me that when they start to understand the traumatic events and how to deal with it and how to talk to these young men that are on their football teams, it's literally changed the way that they engage and interact with those players as they go through the season. So it gives us a really good platform to help coaches that are directly connected with some of these young men that are getting hit with most of the trauma, a better way to deal and a better way to explain what's going on. Um, and then going into, just looking at my notes, some of the internal sustainment within the police department. Um, we've ingrained trauma-informed and victim services questions in all of our promotional exams at all levels. So the expectation is, is if you wish to move into a command or executive position within the police department, you need to understand our victim services policy. You need to understand what trauma-informed policing looks like because there's going to be questions in your exam, either the written or in the assessment center that's gonna test your knowledge of that and your ability to apply that. Uh, we have awards set up in our annual awards program that recognizes officers either in patrol or in investigations that have done an exemplary job of connecting with a victim, restoring them, bringing them around, doing whatever they can to help them from a, from a victim services position. And we recognize that officially within the police department. I also was able to connect with a certified Brene Brown Dare to Lead facilitator who came in and I took 21 members of my police department at all levels through a Dare to Lead um, resiliency training, if you will, those familiar with Brene's work. And we spent three days getting real with each other. And as, they, as our instructor put it, rumbling through vulnerability for those familiar with Brene's work, which that was fantastic to see 21 police officers doing that because most times we just grunt at each other and throw stuff, but to see them break down and have real conversations 
was fantastic. And what it started is we're going to do annual cohorts of those groups and bring them back together so we can continue to push that vulnerability and encourage link within law enforcement. We need to pay attention to that. So I know that I've probably gone over in my time and I apologize for that. Um, but I just appreciate the opportunity to come today to let you all hear about what we do in Chattanooga and to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's my turn. Um, and I'm Marsha Morgan and I work in Missouri or Missouri, um, depending on how you wanna pronounce it. And um, some folks say it depends on which political party you're in and how you, um, how you pronounce our state's name. So I wanna give you just a little bit of background and a um, little bit of how we got to where we are today. We were in the uh, in the 1990s. Our um, our officers were being called to many mental health calls, and some of what was happening was that our um, our folks who have mental illness were actually getting shot and killed by police officers. Some of it was police assisted suicide. Um, other times it was just that there was um, officers were um, frightened and so were the folks. So the mental health system and the police system began working together. We created and patterned after Memphis, Tennessee's model of uh, crisis intervention teams. And from that, we created a really, really strong partnership between the mental health system and police departments. And officers across the state are trained in crisis intervention. One of the things that happened then as a result of that is when we launched our community initiative on trauma, we were um, we invited our police to come to learn more about, about that piece because they were already very involved in the work that we were doing. Um, we were, we, <laughs> I'm laughing because when I uh, we received a grant to put together a program for secondary trauma, and when we approached our police department to help develop that training, recognizing that we as mental health people cannot provide training to police officers, police officers really have to provide that training, um, but we can assist and we can support. Um, at first, there was a lot of reluctance, and um, we were um, we were sort of dismissed, I guess, in terms of our offer to create the training. What happened, though, were um, was that our captains, who we had approached, were on calls, and what they were finding was that they were they were responding to officers who were. Um, in distress, officers who were suicidal, officers who were um, actually assaulting their and, and being um, perpetrators in domestic violence. There were officers who um, were being arrested for driving under the influence and they came back to us and said, you know what, maybe you're onto something. And we spent the next nine months then creating and developing a four hour training called Building Resilience, Surviving Secondary Trauma for First Responders. That training now has been offered to thousands of folks um, really across the nation, mostly by Major Darren Ivey, who is my partner. I'm not gonna say in crime because um, we're doing all this really good work. The other thing that, and the Building Resilience, Surviving Secondary Trauma, really spent is is post certified here in Missouri and has been post certified in other states as they present the training. The first half of the training is really around um, the cost of caring, the cost of being a police officer. And then the second half of the training offers um, tips, offers mindfulness, um, deep breathing, offers resources and encouragement for officers to um, go into therapy if they feel like that's something that they could benefit from to alleviate post-traumatic stress, recognizing that many, many officers um, do have symptoms of post-traumatic stress. The other thing that we then developed was a five-day or 40, 
44 hour train the trainer. So we also have trained over a hundred, around a hundred officers in the states of Missouri and Kansas on delivering the four hour training. So that, and that includes police officers, corrections officers, firefighters, um, folks in children's division who also now are training uh, people on vicarious trauma and then ways to, um, to cope and alleviate that. The other things, just a couple other things that we're doing then is continuing to interface with the police department. So the state of Missouri has in um, what we call community mental health liaisons. The community mental health liaisons ride along with the police officers when they're on the mental health calls so that there's support and intervention and that we can get quick and easy access to services for people who are experiencing mental health symptoms. And the Police Athletic League here in Kansas City is also um, providing supports and actually work, we're working with our um, Police Athletic League and the, the, the participants on um, developing videos about their stories so that they can tell their stories about trauma to, again, help build um, understanding and communication throughout the community. So um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about building resilient surviving secondary trauma. It is an amazing life-changing program. We hear all the time from police officers that they're better parents, they're better um, husbands, wives, they're better um, in the work that they do as a result of the training. So I'll turn it over to Chief Chris. Thank you, Marcia. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you to Dan, thank you to Jesse and, and, and Becky for uh, asking me to join the call and share with you some things that we're doing here in Middle Township. Um, my name is Chris Lusner. I'm the Chief of Police of the Middle Township Police Department and immediate past president for the New Jersey State Association of Chiefs of Police. So uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here if I can um, and just quickly to a PowerPoint, if we can get the, if I can get this to come up. Okay, so uh, real quick PowerPoint, you know, I like to call 21st century policing. I've used the term trauma-informed policing, trauma-responsive policing. Um, but, you know, as we're talking a lot about what does policing look like in the 21st century, I think trauma needs to be right at the, the forefront and the center of what police departments are doing in this country. So I always start with the definition of community problem-oriented policing, and this is the definition from the U.S. Department of Justice. But you look at various definitions, it, these are the, the points that are they're in just about every definition. Engaging partners in the community, real partnership, and getting at the underlining or root causes of crime or social disorder. And I've been chief since uh, October 1st, 2009. And I've always broken my community policing strategy down to these three categories, enforcement, which is an important part. Um, intervention efforts is where a lot of my efforts had been focused earlier uh, in my career, thinking I was practicing community problem-oriented policing, connecting people with substance abuse treatment services, mental health services, housing services. Uh, I took $20,000 out of my budget to have a trained social worker in our municipal court and those programs are important and they will continue. But when I got involved in a grant in the public health field four years ago through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, I came to think completely differently about community problem-oriented policing. And when I learned about the ACES study and we've taken the grant funds here in a coalition in Cape May County to reduce the impact of ACES, I said, man, this is the root cause. We need to be focused on uh, reducing adverse childhood experiences, helping to build resilience in our youth and be focused on the education and prevention, um, probably more than the other categories, in my opinion. It's such a smart business uh, decision. So I said, you know, we need to go upstream because when you look at the root causes in a lot of cases, why people come in contact with the police department, you can trace it back to ACEs. Um, you know, what is predictable 
is preventable. So I wasn't exactly sure how to go about that as a police chief. Uh, but as I started to get to ex exposed to more experts, done a lot of work with Dr. Lori Desitel from Butler University. She's the head of their educational uh, neuroscience unit. I've been to in Indiana a number of times with Dr. Desitel, her co-author, Michael McKnight. I started to see that there are a lot of things that we can do as a police department and why this is directly connected to public safety. So the first part was training. Every one of my officers saw the film Resilience, the Biology of Stress and the Science of Hope, such a powerful film. We've held community screenings here in our community, but every officer saw that film. I then delivered training, which I normally don't do as a, a police chief. We're 61 sworn officers here, around 100 employees total, but I delivered the training because I wanted them to know that it was a priority from the top. Uh, this is just a brief overview of the training I put together with Dr. Desitel and, and Mike McKnight and some other experts. Uh, you know, overview of uh, toxic stress and the impact on, of brain development, uh, pain-based behavior, understanding that, you know, the, the behavior in a lot of people we're dealing with was coming from a, a, a place of pain, uh, persistent state of alarm, uh, the amygdala, be aware of training, treating pain with pain. Um, you know, we all, can all look back in our law enforcement careers, those that are on the call from law enforcement, and remember those boot camps we used to have for young people and understanding how that was a, so counterproductive. And then also talking ab uh, about skills for police officers to um, regulate themselves and then regulate a child on scene. It takes a calm brain to calm another brain. And the whole goal with the training was, for me, was this, was to change the mindset from what's wrong with this kid to what happened to this kid. Because if you can get the officer to look at it through that lens, you're gonna see so many different opportunities. And you know, I can think back on my beginning of my career and going into you know, schools and having a teacher say to me, you know, I could tell you, you know, you'll be locking that kid up, right? We should never accept that that's just gonna be the outcome for um, a, a child, right? We should never accept that. Um, but I didn't have the training and I, we got to get a lot of this training in the hands of teachers, which we're doing here in Cape May County, but we've got to look at it through that lens. Doesn't mean there's not consequences. You know, if there's a crime and human being hurts another human being, we're going to deal with that, but we need to have short-term strategies and we need to have long-term strategies invest in our communities. So this shift wasn't, um, exactly easy, but we've made a lot of progress and I believe my ulcers are buying in and, and the one the, the one area that I think has been really helpful is to talk about the trauma the police officers see. And in New Jersey here, we have a program called Resilient for Officers. This program was uh, built and modeled off of the United States military and the FBI National Academy. We're in the process of training resiliency officers in each police department. I have an officer that's a master resiliency officer. We have training next week. Every police officer knows a police department or has a friend in the department or a neighboring department that has struggled with coping with the things that they've seen. I had an officer that committed suicide in 2012. Um, I've had officers that have struggled, struggled with substance abuse and coping with the things they've seen. We see terrible, terrible things. And I don't know any other way to put it than it just kind of lives inside you. And we take young you know, young adults, 21, 22 years old, and we put them on the road and deal with some of our most complex problems in society. I had never seen a dead body when I uh, got hired as a police officer. And within the first month, I was on a car accident where an 18 year old kid had died and the radio was playing. And I remember thinking about that, that night and then the days after thinking, you know, that, that quick, he's, he's gone. He was listening to that, to that radio seen people shot and stabbed and all the terrible things that we see. And then, you know, not only the trauma the, you know, when you see something, a violent event, but I often, you know, put up my phone and talk about, oh, I get an alert report at the end of every shift and every shift, there's an overview of what happened and it's all negative. You know, it is domestic violence disputes. Like Becky said, it's, you know, um, aggravated assaults, car accidents, fraud, theft, it's just all negative interactions. And those officers, we're going to change their shift in two weeks, by the way. So they're going to be up at night and then they're going to be up there in the day. And it's going to be day after day, week after week. 
you know, year after year, they're going to be in these environments. And we really have to be focused on how do we make sure we're preparing them for the trauma that they're seeing and the job so they can be trauma informed with themselves before we ask them to go be trauma informed in the community. It is so, so important that we invest in that. And here in New Jersey, uh, last year when I was president of the State Association, until we got interrupted by COVID in March, my term ended in the middle of the summer, I made this my number one priority to uh, promote trauma-informed practices and police youth engagement. The Attorney General in New Jersey just announced Handle with Care Directive statewide, which I'll talk about, but we're going to have training next month for police officers in this state, and we have a training session that's going to tie in with this resilience program that's already stood up here in New Jersey, start talking about some of the ACEs that police officers bring into the job, triggers they may have, and then trying to raise awareness of, of this program and make sure that we're reaching our officers. So that was the first part. That was the training. I say training has to be the foundation. Get that shift in the officers. And then next was some policies that I introduced. Police officers are on the front lines when these traumatic events happen, when children are present. And Becky talked about it, the IACP, uh, I was involved in that resolution to be passed in 2019, um, had some excellent uh, material through Yale Childhood Development Center on how to handle calls for service when children are present to reduce the dose of trauma. How do you reduce the dose of trauma when officers are on scene? So I put this policy together with that material, with Dr. Desitel, who had given me some feedback, just some examples, not making an arrest in front of a child when possible, officer safety has to come first, not using a child as a, a, a when there's a language barrier as an interpreter, not interviewing criminal uh, witnesses uh, of a crime in front of children, uh, SWAT operations. How do we handle SWAT operations when children are present? I was a SWAT commander for 10 years. Um, how do we handle that? How do we make sure we have a plan for the child when the scene is secure? Death notifications when children are present. Uh, all this is covered in a four page policy that was delivered as part of the training. The next piece was handle with care that started in West Virginia. We were the second municipality in the state of New Jersey to do handle with care. Our typical communication with the schools had revolved around when a child was, just pre was in trouble, not when a child was just present to make sure that that information gets to the school before the bell rings the following day so that they don't compound the trauma, the schools. We had 116 referrals in our first year. Those are 116 situations where we would not have communicated with the school. And those aren't kids in trouble. They were just present at something that was dramatic. Such a simple program and an important program to make a difference in the lives of children. This is my school resource officer, my elementary school officer, Julio. One of the things in our trauma responsive policing policy is a follow-up visit after a dramatic event. We try to accomplish that with our school resource officer. He has lunch with a different group of kids every single day, and we'll include a kid that had a handle with care referral in that lunch without them knowing, to have that positive interaction with the SRO. We'll schedule a high five in the hallway, um, just as part of our efforts and following our policy to, to help with that event. And the last piece, which I'm going to hit really quickly and I'll be done, is building connections with kids. I, was, I loved hearing the stuff that Chief Roddy was doing, the mentorship, the positive interactions between a positive role model and a kid is the road to, to helping them build resiliency. So community problem-oriented policing is not a program, it's a philosophy. It's how you view yourself as a police department, how you view yourself in the community. So in Middle Township, we used to have one program in the fifth grade. It's called LEAD, Law Enforcement Against Drugs. Used to, we used to do DARE. It's a very similar program. We expanded that to the seventh grade. We added a DEA program in the fourth grade about prescription drug, drug safety. And then we added an opiate prevention program in the 10th grade. So the curriculum is important, but that positive interaction between cops and kids is what I'm after and is being driven and informed our decisions because we're trying to have those positive interactions and help these kids build, res build resiliency. So we expanded that significantly. Next, we went to a police youth camp where kids come in six days for the summer. Um, they interact with police officers. 
we do fun police stuff with them, but then we take them into the community and do things. This is the Coast Guard base in Cape May. Anyone that enters the Coast Guard base goes through boot camp in the city of Cape May. We deliver life skills curriculum, evidence-based through a partner every day. Each day has a theme, goal-making, decision-making. And it's a just the goal again of having positive interactions with kids. The school recommends kids that come from challenging circumstances, they automatically get in. The remaining uh, applications goes to a lottery system. These are qu just some quick pictures. This is a picture from our first year. It's Officer Blake Martindale. This is a couple detectives at the police academy. This is a local amusement park. That's Sergeant Mark Higginbottom. That's Sergeant Josh Bryan. I don't know how that youngster's on one arm. We do PT in the morning. We have a dive team in Middle Township. That's a corporal in the pool. Again, doing some physical fitness, that's Sergeant Bryan. And then we graduate at the end of the uh, police youth camp on National Night Out, and they get awards. And this is the police director's awards. This is Oscar here. His parents were so proud. They didn't speak very good English. I got to talk to them a little bit, but they, they, they were so proud of Oscar. He shook the hand of every instructor at the end of uh, each day. He worked so hard. Um, and we're really proud of him. And, and, and he was new to the community. So this was nice to kind of integrate into the community, um, this police youth camp for, for a new family. Next, again, we're looking for connections with kids over an extended period of time, just not through one program. So this is a police officer trading card program we did. You collect 15 cards, you get a prize bag. The business community partnered with us. It's been outstanding. We had 30,000 views within a week on Facebook. It was our most popular Facebook post ever. The community is starving for this information. Next, we started a club in the middle school where cops play game, eat, um, video games with kids. They have a life skill lesson in the beginning through a partner, Cape Assist. Then they play appropriate video games with cops, positive interactions. Next, we did a program pause on patrol where police officers in uniform are going into the kindergarten and pre-K level, just playing with kids. 20 minutes rotating amongst classrooms, positive interactions. And these are just pictures from our Facebook page where officers on patrol, part of their regular shift is interacting and people have posted to our page, getting that buy-in, it's just not a philosophy. And one of the things that, that I didn't expect when we started to design and do all these things, it was for, okay, science is leading the way, let's build resiliency in these kids. The impact on the officers, this benefits the officers, taking them out of that negative kind of cycle they do and having them interact when there's not a problem, crisis or emergency is important and healthy for them too. I didn't see that coming. Again, these are just pictures of our officers from our Facebook page. This is an officer at an apartment Get complex Go. doing a race with a kid. Oh, Fred, I think he's got you, Fred. That was posted by a parent. And finally, I'm with this. And I tell police chiefs, and when I was president of the state association, I say, why do you do this? Well, number one, it changes lives, right? But outside that, this is an investment. This is a smart business decision. It's a safer community, and it saves money. It expands and improves the workforce. We've been doing a lot of really good work with the, with the Chamber of Commerce here in our community, talking about everybody remembers their first boss and the opportunity that they have, kind of how like Chief Roddy talked about the recreational sport coach, sports coaches. Our goal is a trauma-informed community. The police, we're not gonna solve this ourselves, but we can bring people together, cross-sector collaboration to have a trauma-informed community. And I know that investment over the long-term is gonna make a big difference. So those are the, some of the a few things that we're doing uh, here in New Jersey and Middle Township, and I will turn it over to Dan. Uh, we still have Rob to hear from. Oh, I mean, Rob, I'm sorry. No worries. Great job, Chief. Okay, Rob. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I can't see anything. I am calling from a car. Rob. Let me yeah. intervene for a second. Is is Megan on? Yes, I am. Okay, um, Rob, we're we're running out of time. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk next week. 
next okay. next one. I hate to do it to you. Okay. I, whatever you whatever so you want. Fun. Okay. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, th thank you all for your incredible presentations. Uh, hopefully, some of this information will be able to be put to work uh, in your communities. Can you stay on the right hand side, right here. Oh, okay. Put the ticket up here, up here, and stay on the right hand side. Okay. Oh, somebody needs to turn their mic off. Um, and uh, we have one more speaker. Um, Megan is a member of the uh, CTIP board C and um, a professor and um, has been doing work with the Philadelphia uh, law enforcement system on uh, juvenile justice. And we wanted to uh, take that perspective in as well. So Megan, you wanna take it from here? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Megan Corredo. Sorry, I do not have a PowerPoint presentation to show you what has been happening because I'm actually in the thick of it. So, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the work that I've been doing uh, with the city of Philadelphia. So uh, I'm Megan Corredo. I'm a doctor of social work. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've been working with um, children, um, youth, uh, children, youth, and families for about 14 years now. And um, I've been working on a lot of different capacities. Um, right now, I'm teaching full time at Bremer College's Graduate School of Social Work and Social Research. And I've also been doing some um, consulting work with systems. So it's really exciting to me um, to be able to take the individual interactions that I've had with trauma survivors and with youth who've experienced complex trauma and then take um, that knowledge and that expertise and apply it to how we intervene to provide support to systems. So um, I'm, I'm gonna tell you today, I, there's a lot of different things I could talk to you all about. Um, I love uh, talking about trauma, but not just talking about how trauma negatively impacts us, but also strategies and pathways to trauma healing. I think we really need to focus on pathways to trauma healing with the same enthusiasm that we talk about um, the, the negative ways that trauma impacts us. So just to give you a little bit of context on this project, um, so the city of Philadelphia, um, well, let me back up. So uh, the Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies provided a, um, it was like a, a call to mayors in cities all over the country. And basically the call was to say, if you were able to change anything about your city, what would you change? And different people um, presented various things, uh, various ideas about what they would want to change in their cities. In Philadelphia in 2018, they received some seed funding in order to identify, their idea was that they wanted to change the first several hours after a juvenile was arrested. So um, when, when a juvenile is arrested in the city of Philadelphia and in, in most places, a lot of other systems kind of get activated as a result of that initial arrest. Um, so the idea behind Philadelphia's initiative was that within the first five hours after arrest, it's really overwhelming, it's very jarring um, for a juvenile, for a child, for a youth. And um, there were a lot of areas for potential improvement within those first several hours. So Philadelphia um, did, a, did a pilot project where they said, if we were to re-envision what the arrest process looks like for youth, like ideally we wouldn't wanna arrest youth, but when we do, we, um, or when, when we have to, the idea would be that we have these different things that are in place so that um, it's not necessarily as traumatizing or overwhelming for them. So there was actually this mock-up that took place in the Philadelphia Convention Center. And um, they had these different partitions, walls up to, to designate where they would have different spaces. So the intake area, the area, the holding area, an area for social work interviews, an area for, um, for families as they're waiting to pick up somebody who is going to be released. And they did these walkthroughs with um, Bloomberg Philanthropies and with different um, trauma-informed leaders um, throughout the country and especially in the city of Philadelphia. So um, the idea was that we would be transforming this arrest process um, because we know that many, many youth, um, statistics show between 75% and 90% of youth that are entering the juvenile justice system have also experienced trauma. So, um, and, and many, many of the youth have experienced poly victimization. So multiple forms of trauma um, at different points in times in their lives. 
So we had this walkthrough and we invited different groups to come and look at the walkthrough. So we had youth who had actually been impacted by the juvenile justice system walkthrough. And they gave their feedback. They said how things were for them when they were arrested. And then they said how things, um, uh, different, different things that they noticed about this proposed changed process. Um, I facilitated focus groups with the youth. There were a group of youth from, um, a, it's connected with a residential um, treatment facility, but like a vocational school called De La Salle. And then there was a group of youth from uh, Job, not Job Corps, um, Power Corps, which is also based in Philadelphia. And they gave their feedback. I facilitated dialogue with them. And I also, I created an intervention to support youth called um, Stories with the Z. And I had different materials and um, artistic images and things all throughout the walkthrough um, as a way for us to re-envision what this arrest process could potentially look like. Then Philadelphia put in the full proposal and they actually won it. So Philadelphia was chosen as um, one, of, one of the uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies cities that received a million dollars in order to introduce some reforms to this um, juvenile arrest process. So um, where are we now? Um, well, I came on board as the trauma consultant. So my job was to, um, and there's like a few things that are part of my scope of work. So one of the things is to support them in identifying trauma-informed policies and procedures. Um, so, so that there are these trauma-informed concepts, ideas, and processes that are already embedded into the system so that ideally over time as the system grows, as it's no longer in our hands, so that things can be sustainable and put in place in a way that is trauma-informed. Um, another part of my responsibility is to create the trauma and youth development training, which is actually, it's, it's almost done, it's almost there, um, but not quite just yet. And uh, I can, I might be able to just, I could just like show you a sneak preview. Um, so uh, it's been a really interesting project because it involves all these different systems. So when a youth is arrested, all these different systems become activated. There's the DA's office, there's juvenile probation. Sometimes there's Department of Human Services, there's police, um, there's families, there's sometimes um, uh, Philadelphia's Medicaid dollars are managed by an organization called CBH, Community Behavioral Health. So um, CBH providers, mental health Medicaid providers also get, um, get alerted at times. So there's all these systems, and I'm not even naming all of them, that kind of get activated when a youth is arrested. So something really interesting system-wide that we've been doing is, so everybody has kind of their piece in the arrest process. And um, there are so many opportunities for potential re-traumatization, but there's also so much potential for people to adopt and implement a trauma-informed approach all throughout the process. So we actually worked with, um, it's called uh, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia's Participatory Design Lab, which I just, I started working with them a couple years ago with an Office of Homeless Services project. And it's really exciting because their specialty is figuring out ways to take really complex multi-system information, figuring out how to organize it with the, with the person in mind. Their philosophy is like that system should be designed for people. Um, people shouldn't be made to adapt to systems. So um, they support in like really refining and um, clarifying a lot of complex information so that it makes sense, so that it's clear and also has the person at the center of whatever interactions are happening. So um, actually, and we were doing this all throughout the pandemic, we were meet, meeting virtually. So we have these uh, really complicated charts that says what police are gonna do when a juvenile is arrested and, and the different scenarios that could happen along with the arrest. So is the person going to be diverted um, back into the community? Is the person um, gonna be picked up by a parent? Is the person gonna be charged as an adult? And I, I've been supporting them and identifying what are key moments for youth that might be particularly distressing? Um, what are some processes that can be put in place for, um, for whoever's interacting with youth, whether it's officers or social work staff or administrators um, to be able to support them? So the, the name of the project right now, and it might change, is um, the JAC slash YARP. It's not the best acronym, but um, JAC stands for Juvenile Assessment Center and YARP is Youth Arrest Reform Project. 
So the Jack is like this is this physical facility that um, when there's approval with the money, given all the COVID cuts, there would actually be a physical site, a place where youth are going to be routed. So as opposed to them um, remaining at the districts, they would be they would go to this site, and at this site, all of the officers, all of the social work staff. Um, all the people that encounter youth would be um, trained in trauma-informed processes. And also that's where we would be implementing those trauma-informed policies and procedures so that, um, that youth are treated in a respectful, supportive, collaborative way. I have to admit, we did walkthroughs of um, what, what the conditions look like now for youth. And um, it, thinking about the fact that there's 75, 75 to 90% of youth who are in the juvenile justice system are uh, traumatized and then looking at, at where where they are um, being held for hours um, for hours at end um, with limited information to know what's happening. Um, they don't know if their caregivers are being contacted. They may or may not have been offered any food. And um, we also know that like when people don't know, there's the, um, the technical term for this is intolerance of uncertainty. That's actually like a researched concept. Um, which I didn't know, I learned that. Um, that when people don't know what to expect, their level of anxiety and angst and frustration can actually escalate. And that can also lead to aggressive behaviors. So, um, so that's the Jack part where there's gonna actually be a physical site where all youth are routed to and where um, staff are trained in trauma-informed principles. And then, so COVID kind of made us do, a, um, do some twists and turns. So now what we've really been focusing on a lot is the YARP part. So the Youth Arrest Reform Project. And that idea basically says, um, we, we can't necessarily have the center right now. However, um, we can begin to implement some of the reforms even in the districts and throughout the city whenever a juvenile is arrested so that um, we have like kind of this interim plan um, until we're able to get um, the additional support from the city in order to identify, find, build out this physical space. Um, so part of my work, it's, it's been really exciting and interesting to work with a lot of different professionals. So at our meetings, we have people at the table across all different disciplines. And, um, and, and I have been creating the trauma training, the trauma and youth development training for the Philadelphia Police Department. And um, this is going to be implemented for people who are staffing the Jack, but it's also going to um, be used by officers at the academy so that everybody is also going through this particular training. Um, and they're also going to figure out, we haven't discussed the details of this yet, this yet but they're going to figure out a way to also capture um, or, or train some of the, uh, the officers that are already on duty. So I can just, I'll just show you a sneak preview. Um, I'm gonna warn you, there's like 500 slides. Um, so part of my process in creating this training was to, um, I wanted to engage officers. I wanted to meet them where they were. I also wanted to figure out how to take really highly theoretical clinical terms and break them down in ways that are accessible. I don't know about you all, but sometimes I look at the trauma literature and it feels very overwhelming because in technical, which it is, but there are like, it's really important for us to also have clear, succinct, specific ways for us to explain what it is that we're doing so that people can connect with what we're talking about. Um, so I looked through piles and piles of books um, all through quarantine and articles, I have folders of articles um, that spoke to different things that would be important for officers and even social service staff who are interacting with youth um, during these really intense, overwhelming moments um, within the first few hours of arrest. And I, I do have to point out that uh, this is focused, this work, this project is focused on the first few hours of arrest. Um, it would be incredible for us to be able to implement these changes all across the system. But we know that oftentimes um, system change begins with like one project, one initiative, and then hopefully, ideally over time, things can expand and grow as, as um, you know, the initiative gains momentum. So I don't know if I'm supposed to show you all this, but I'm gonna show you. Um, so there are, as you can see, 477 slides and the training is broken into four modules. 
Um, so, and then this is just an idea of the modules. Um, so we start off with trauma foundations. Then we explore trauma-informed approaches and youth development. So let me back up. In trauma foundations, we're talking about what is trauma? What are diff different definitions of trauma? What types of trauma might people experience? What are um, symptoms, signs and symptoms that someone may have experienced trauma? And then what are some of the general pathways to healing? Because, um, you know, I wanted to highlight that, not because officers are providing the treatment, but because sometimes you intervene with somebody and you don't know what happen, happens next, or you don't know what, um, what may support that person in moving forward in the future. So, you know, having that general idea can be helpful. Then the next module is trauma-informed approaches and youth development. So um, this, this module talks about what does it mean to be trauma-informed? And there are actually four principles that we highlighted as being um, really central to this particular project. I'll talk to you all about that in a second. We talked about um, youth development, youth brain development. Um, what are some challenges that youth are experiencing um, in adolescence? What are some opportunities in adolescence? Um, and then how can um, officers interact with youth in this developmental stage in a developmentally appropriate way? Then there's trauma justice impacted youth and de-escalation. So what are, what are some things that cause youth to escalate or people who are traumatized to escalate? And then what are some things that we can do to avoid things getting to the level of um, aggression, acting out behavior? What are some things that we can implement in an attempt to de-escalate and calm things down? And then the last module is about officer trauma. And in that section, we're talking about how frequently officers are exposed to trauma, some of the signs and symptoms of officer trauma, and then some specific self-care strategies that officers can implement as they're seeking to process, um, process traumas as well. And the statistics that I found about how frequently officers are exposed to trauma, it's really, it's really jarring. So what I found as I was looking at the literature is like, it's like you have these two traumatized groups coming together um, in a really stressful, intense moment and in intense encounters. Um, when I looked at the statistics for youth entering the juvenile justice system, their trauma rates were really high. When I looked at the um, officer rates for trauma too, those were also very high. And then I'm gonna talk to you briefly about um, the four principles that we came up with. So, um, oh, let me back up. So this training is not just gonna include these slides, but I also interviewed officers. I asked them different questions. Um, I asked them all the same questions and, and um, got their video responses. Those responses are gonna be included in the training so that officers can see themselves in the training content. Um, I also um, had some uh, focus groups with officers um, that happened within the past couple of weeks where I asked them about their encounters with youth and I'm gonna use their responses to guide and inform the case scenarios and the activities that I'm gonna create because I really want it to be scenarios that they may face on a regular basis. Um, and then I'm also, I have interviews scheduled with youth too because I wanna capture the youth voice so that officers and staff who are going through this training can actually hear the youth voice um, and their perspectives of what may be helpful or harmful when an officer is approaching them in, a tense and, in an intense and overwhelming situation. And then, so uh, we have these strategic work group meetings that involve all the different stakeholders that are part of the project. And we have these um, strategic work group meetings every week, I mean, every month, excuse me, not every week. And um, I felt like it would be really important for us to hone in on which trauma-informed principles we wanted to focus on for the purposes of this project. So there are so many different trauma and lists of trauma-informed principles. Um, depending on the theorists that you're looking at, like, and depending on the trauma-informed environment you're trying to, um, to intervene with, there are like a million different lists. So I, I actually asked all of the community stakeholders or the, the project stakeholders to um, take a minute to uh, do a survey and I, I gave them different lists and I asked them to highlight from the perspective of their system, which trauma-informed principles seemed most pertinent. And I, I looked at their responses and then I organized them into these four principles. So there's safety and then each of these, this is also included in the training. Um, so each of these has like a youth component and a staff or officer component. So there's safety, there's respect, there's communication, and then there's also hope. 
um, which hope was an interesting one. Nobody actually said the word hope in their responses, but there was this, um, people were speaking to this, this idea that you are not your crime, that um, despite the fact that you have displayed this behavior or you have been arrested, that there is still possible ways for you to turn the corner and to, um, to continue forward in the future. And I, I thought that um, using the word hope to capture that was the best way to capture it. So the officers, the staff are going to um, understand what each of these concepts are and their application to work with youth who are entering the juvenile justice system. And um, so something, if you're interested in learning more about this particular initiative, um, this is kind of timely, but the article just came out today where they were hi they're highlighting my work with, um, they're highlighting my work with uh, the city of Philadelphia and in conjunction with the um, with Bloomberg Philanthropies. So I will put that link in the chat. Um, and that that art, oops, I just sent it privately. That article actually um, has links to like more information about my work, about um, the city of Philadelphia's um, initial proposal for um, the, um, the Bloomberg Cities Challenge and all of that. There's like multiple links within that particular article. So yeah, I think I just, I was talking a million miles a minute, but I think I, I summarized as, as best I could all the different complex intersecting systems work that's going on. And then hopefully I'm hoping that, um, that some of those charts and some of that information that we are developing will, um, I'm pretty sure that it will also be shared externally. Um, but right now, you know, you know, when you're in the middle of a project, it's a little bit difficult to share out like specific images and visuals and things because it hasn't received the final approval. But yeah, um, I believe that many of the things will be available and Philadelphia is looking to be um, looking to be a leader in in this area. Megan, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Well, let's, it's about 3.30, but uh, if people are willing to stay on a little bit longer, <clears throat> I wanted to throw out a <clears throat> question to Megan and the officers. Um, <clears throat> what would you recommend to people on the phone in terms of approaching the law enforcement uh, departments in their communities? to get them to become trauma-informed. What do you consider to be the key windows into their thinking? Megan, you wanna go first and then yes, Chiefs? Sure, so I would say relationship building. So um, when, when I think about an interaction with an individual, like as a therapist, I don't go to someone and say, hi, all of your parenting skills are bad and we need to change this and change it quick because this is problematic and you're, you're being abusive. Um, we don't necessarily want to start off that way. And I think for some reason, when we're approaching systems, sometimes we start off that way, saying like, this is all that you have been doing wrong as a system, instead of building relationships with the systems that we're trying to intervene with. Um, prior to me uh, being chosen as the trauma consultant for this project, I was also trying to build relationships um, with some of the, the key leaders um, as it relates to this work. And I feel like that's really important. Sometimes we get really um, ambitious and excited and, and our hearts and minds are in the right place, but um, we, we don't also respect like the resilience and, and the work that's already being done. And I feel like starting, starting with building those relationships, um, when I have a relationship with someone, whether that's a person or a system, they're more likely to hear my recommendations for trauma-informed care than if I just come in like a tornado and just tell everybody what they're doing wrong. Thank you. Um, Chris? You... Sure. Um, I think relationships are important. I would share the IACP resolution to show that this is uh, something that a very well-respected organization says that we should be focused on. Um, the other thing that I would focus on is if your department doesn't have a handle a care program and you have relationships in your community with folks in the education field, uh, you can point to, uh, I believe Tennessee, Becky was saying handle a care is a statewide initiative in Tennessee. It was just announced 
uh, a couple weeks ago here in New Jersey that it is a statewide initiative in New Jersey. I think I heard on the call yesterday a state uh, passed a bill where they mandated this. So uh, I think, you know, getting some information in those areas and taking it to your chief of police and, and talking uh, to him or her about that uh, would be helpful. I think the important part is why. Once you can get a few minutes, why is this in the lane of public safety? I think the community problem-oriented policing. I don't think you'll find any chief that says they don't practice community problem-oriented policing. Um, and if you go into the angle, here's some, some things that you can use to, to promote that. I think you'll be successful. And then the other part I'll say in closing, you know, um, there's a whole lot of focus on policing right now. What does it look like going forward? And I believe, I go back to my final slide, we do this because this changes lives. It's a smart business decision, it's public safety, but it also helps with uh, building trust in our communities, right? That's something that a lot of chiefs are focusing on. How do we build trust in our, uh, with our communities? And then police legitimacy. These are topics that are uh, getting a lot of attention right now in the circles around police reform. And I think that, you know, a trauma informed approach hits all the marks that you want as a police chief or executive um, leading in this environment that we find ourselves in. Good point, really good point. I see we have several other officers on the call. Officer Dahlman, do you wanna offer some thoughts? Introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Tony Dolman, James City County Police Department in Virginia. Uh, and uh, we're, we're really uh, just starting this journey. And uh, we're, I, you know, I'm, I'm here to educate myself and, and to uh, really start to bring trauma-informed practices to our police department. Uh, we have a community network, a trauma-informed community network. Uh, and we're, we're, like I said, really just getting started on this journey. And uh, I'm excited to... Uh, to learn from all of you. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Um, Chief Rody, Rody, are you still on? Yes, sir. Um, I'm, yeah, everything that, well, and everything the chief said, um, I'll, I'll add in one component that we, we move around here is when you go to implement a new program within law enforcement, um, we're real quick to say everything's finite in government work. Number of hours we have, number of officers we have, the, the bandwidth we have to take on something. So from a leadership perspective, while we all really enjoy the stories and the articles and everything about becoming a transformational leader, we, we really like as police chiefs to think that everyone that's ever worked for us is gonna be this much better, more educated, taller, more charming, more funny person after they've worked underneath our, our leadership. Um, which is entirely true. But the, the part that you have to reflect on is at times you have to be transactional. You have to figure out if you're going to put and build something new in an organization, um, what are the benefits for that? What, is, what are the pragmatic decisions that makes that worth the agencies and the leadership's time to absorb it? So the things that we got into was pushing to where we actually measured as best we could of how trauma informed, especially from a victim centered perspective could be measured in our agency. Um, and we heard the word mentioned several times was trust, which one of the biggest indicators that we use to gauge the level of trust between the community and the police department is our clearance rates, especially our homicide clearance rates. Most homicides are solved by witnesses willing to come forward and talk to the police department that polices their neighborhoods. And if they won't talk to us and tell us what happened, that diminishes our ability to clear crime, specifically homicides and violent crimes. So when we get into understanding the clearance rates and you can see clearance rates go up, you can actually show a measured impact to administrators, to funding sources, to city council members, to community groups, when you go and present back and you get into showing them that the clearance rate is actually above what you were last year, above a national average. That's measurable, that's quantifiable. And it goes a long way when you get into conversations, especially with other agencies of, this is how you sell something that you can't touch. Um, we all, I think everybody on here absolutely recognizes the importance of relationships and trust and connecting with one another. That's hard to measure, but a clearance rate gives you that. The other flip side of that is, is when you get into the conversations with your officers and chiefs, is when you go into the typical type of crime that has a low clearance rate, 
property crimes. And the national average is between 30 and 40 percent, depending upon which one you're talking about, which if you measure success in law enforcement of investigating a crime and catching a bad guy, then that means we as law enforcement fail 70 percent of the time. That's not acceptable. We need to figure out how that moves differently. So when you start to explain to officers and chiefs, you may not catch the suspect that committed this crime. But if you come from it from a victim-centered trauma-informed approach to how you have the conversations and how you work through the needs of that victim, while you may never bring the perpetrator to justice, that victim will feel supported. So you need to start figuring out how to measure success in another way. That's the trust and relationship we're talking about. So it gives you different performance measures within your agency when you come into understanding the, the approach to accepting this in, become transactional a little bit in that conversation and show what you can measure and what you can sell. Thank you. Um, Captain Tillman, would you like to? Had to unmute there. Uh, you know, the, the good news for us today at, at Wilmington is a lot of the programs that we heard being discussed, Wilmington is involved in. You know, there are certainly some, some other avenues that we could pursue to get our police department more involved in in resilience. Um, but a lot of the community engagement programs we're already involved in. We run a police athletic league here. We do a summer youth camp for at-risk youth. Uh, we have a social services worker on board that works at the police department that engages with at-risk youth and runs diversion programs. Uh, I think the, the one piece we're missing that everyone's talking about has been, you know, the actual affirmative training and promotion of resilience within the police department. But it was, um, you know, good stuff in the call today. Thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully, come January or next year, Congress will once again get and decide to take on legislation to address police reform. And I think some of the ideas that came out today ought to be embedded in it. Marsha Morgan and I actually started a conversation a couple of months ago with Senator uh, Blunt's office. Uh, about some of the things we've been talking about. And then we're also working on model statewide legislation. And uh, we definitely need to have a section in there on trauma-informed policing. And what we've heard today has just been so valuable in terms of giving us the, the components of that kind of legislation. So thank everybody. My apologies again to Rob Reed. Uh, for uh, cutting them out, but he's a lawyer, so he's thick skinned. And um, we'll see you all uh, next month. We're gonna have a presentation on peer counseling. And then in December, we're gonna have a presentation on trauma uh, informed approaches to racial equity. So we've got some really great stuff coming up and uh, we look forward to you joining us then. Thank you all for staying on above and beyond. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All righty then.